Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cannabis Live. We are so stoked to have you guys here. This can, is going to be a great episode. We're really excited to be joined by Decriminalized Nature, uh, Carlos and Larry. We're going to get to that in just a second, but we want to give a shout out to everyone that's watching us live on Cannabis and our community. We really appreciate your support um, and being a part of that, that space, that place that we have for everyone. So, And if you're watching this on YouTube, please like and subscribe and Join us over on Cannabis. We'd love to have you in our community. It's a really great place. Um, and also, real quick shout out to our friends over at TikiMadman.com. If you need any cannabis genetics, definitely check them out. They've got great seeds, and we're really appreciative for their support. It helps make this uh, live stream possible. Um, well, today, my co host, JR, who's over there on your screen, he's going to be hosting. So he put together a lot of the questions today for Carlos and Larry. So, JR, I figured I'd just throw it over to you uh, to get us started um, with this interview. Thanks, JR, for doing all that you did today. Oh, great. I'm really excited about this episode. Um, I think it's going to help clarify a lot of things for people. And I really appreciate Carlos and Larry's time. And uh, let's go ahead and get into it. Um, I'll just kind of fire the questions out there. And between the two of you, you guys can just kind of, you know, toggle or decide who's going to take that question. Um, and first, uh, the first thing, obviously, we'd like uh, for you to do um, is to uh, introduce us to the history and the mission uh, behind Decriminalized Nature. All right, you want me to uh, take the first crack, Larry? Sounds All good. Right. So, uh, well, the um, I'll say in, in the San Francisco Bay Area, there has been a very deep and rich uh, history of psychedelic use and experience and space holders, and um, a, a lot of folks doing a lot of great underground work. Uh, Larry's been at it for over a decade, um, and oh, I'm, I'm relatively new to it. So I had my first uh, mushroom experience in 2018 and, uh, uh, but was so uh, profoundly impacted by the experience in terms of my ability to uh, understand my own reality that I went out searching for community in, in, here in the Bay Area and uh, found a really amazing community of uh, psychedelic activists. Larry was one of them. Um, we gathered together at uh, a building that uh, at the time I was um, creating a, a healing space out of in. And, uh, and we all came together and we went around and introduced each other. We uh, asked, um, you know, I asked, hey, if, if we could do something with city council where I used to work, what do you all think, what should we do? And one of the people said, well, why don't we run a decriminalization a resolution and uh, so we did and we organized for that and it was pretty amazing just how uh, things sort of from there just unfolded so organically it was almost as if there was nothing we can do to stop it it had a mind of its own the movement the energy all we did was show up and uh, obviously do the work but uh, it was just um, you know the council member right out of the gate um, about a month after we asked him if he'd sponsor it he said yes uh, within three months, we're scheduled for public safety. Within uh, a month after that, we're at the full city council for a vote. And all the while, we're just kind of hanging on to this roller coaster, like, whoa, what the hell is happening here? Uh, and, uh, you know, and then it ended with a, a successful passage of the revolu resolution, a, a, a unanimous yes. After that, we were um, asked by a number of groups throughout the U.S. if um, they could basically have our resolution and if we could help them. And Larry and I were the ones who uh, felt most compelled to really support this, uh, the growth of the national movement. So he and I stepped up and, and, um, and some of the other folks who were more underground space holders didn't really like the national attention. So they sort of walked away from it. We carried the board and rebuilt the board with other folks. And yeah, and then we uh, uh, proceeded from there and supporting other cities to decriminalize. Yeah, and I would say to add to that too, that was a really important time for really um, building the ethos and the ethos is really what we're driving on right now that's something that you know we want to make sure we are a decentralized movement we allow you know every every city is kind of bringing their own energy to to what's happening but really there's an ethos that we want to stick by uh, one of those ethos uh, positions was um, are you know are we just going to do mushrooms are we going to do synthetics or what and so we're in the bay area so we have 
ayahuasca community here. There's cacti community here. There's mushroom community here. There's DMT community here. <clears throat> so we really want to have a bigger conversation about nature and our relationship with nature and the sacred relationship we have with nature. And the fact that no matter where you are on the planet, pretty much your ancestors work with some plants, whether it's medicinal plants, herbal plants, uh, psychoactive plants, you know, antigenic plants and fungi, uh, things like that. So we really want to have this bigger conversation about our relationship with nature and uh, really kind of speak to, uh, you know, because when you have that conversation, you're really empowering people to have their own engagement. You know, we don't have to be dependent upon pharma to create a synthetic for us. You know, just like with cannabis, you can grow your own cannabis. You don't need to <laughs> do with Marinol or any of that other kind of stuff, right? So same sort of thing. We want to really make sure that people are empowered to be able to have their own healing, to be able to do their own healing, that type of thing. So nature was one way that we were looking at that because everyone can learn to grow. It might not be as easy. Some people don't have a green thumb, but but it's much easier than, you know, building a lab in your house and trying to make some sort of synthetic. Uh, another thing that we really want to emphasize too is rather than just doing use and possession, which is what a lot of the other drug policy uh, organizations were doing, we really wanted to, because we're talking about nature, talking about cultivation. So cultivation is typically under the manufacturing subheading, but we wanted to pull that out and really say, this is something different. This is about growing a plant. This isn't something dangerous. This isn't something threatening. This is just about growing the plant. And then the second part of it that we really thought was important was this idea of sharing, <clears throat> coming together in ceremony, coming together uh, with somebody else, being able to have culturally relevant settings, people that know your experience and that type of thing. Uh, that's typically under most uh, you know, controlled substances that consider distribution. Um, but when we're talking about small scale ceremonies, small scale um, you know, com community events, community practices. I think that was something we wanted to engage in as well because uh, people find healing in community and that's what we've been finding over and over again. And so those are the two other things that we want to emphasize besides the nature. I'm sure there's more as well, but uh, but that was a really big time for us to really sort of uh, cultivate, <laughs> no, no pun intended, cultivate our ethos in a good way. Excellent, great. Um, I, I, think, um, I think that's a powerful thing. And I think, uh, you know, humans access to these, uh, these entheogenic uh, plants and fungi are really important. And that being said, can you kind of explain what the uh, entheogenic uh, plant and fungi kind of is and what it means and also its significance to uh, indigenous or even na uh, our native people? Yeah, so I'll start off with the entheogenic part and then maybe Carlos can jump in on the indigenous part. Um, what I think is uh, something that we really discussed right at the very beginning, as well as part of our ethos, was that, um, you know, what term are we going to use for this, you know, and so we already knew right off the bat that the word psychedelic had 50, 60 years of baggage on it, um, you know, people, it takes too long to stories that people have heard, people related to music, people related to art, people related to a cer certain subculture in the 70s, and um, so we're like, well, that's not really you know, maybe the word we want to be working with. And the people are like, well, nobody even knows what the word entheogen means. And we're like, that's perfect. Because I, give, I would much rather spend five minutes defining something for somebody and taking that time than trying to unpack 50 years of baggage. And so we wanted to use this word entheogen. And entheogen even came out as a response to psychedelic. It came out with, uh, um, by a bunch of anthropologists and uh, ethnobotanists in, I think, 1979. And the idea was basically to find another term to speak to indigenous cultures, for example, all across the world that are working with these plant medicines. You wouldn't say that someone's having a psychedelic ayahuasca ceremony or a psychedelic iboga ceremony. Just this doesn't fit, right? So this term entheogenic was one that was sort of came up with uh, to kind of speak to this broader spectrum. Now, entheogenic could be argued to even include synthetics, but we've really taken it the route of nature. Uh, so really focusing on natural plants and mushrooms. Um, you know, uh, entheogen by its its uh, root uh, is, is the root of enthusiasm. And it and basically means to to uh, to generate the divine within, if you will. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people think it means, oh, it's about God or this type of thing. It's, it's really about the inner divinity, the inner experience, seeing sacredness in this experience, and healing is sacred, recreation is sacred. Um, you know, uh, being in ceremony is sacred, having an exploration of consciousness is sacred. So we really want to kind of touch on this sacred aspect. Uh, when we were looking at the resolution, we were initially thinking about, okay, we'll call them sacred healing plants or sacred healing plants and mushrooms. Um, but we were like, well, along the way, people can edit that out. And maybe they're going to edit out the word sacred because this is policy, right? And so then it's just healing plants. And then, oh, maybe it's medicinal plants. And all of a sudden it's medicine. And all of a sudden it's pharma or synthetics or those different types of things. So we're like, how can we embed a word into the resolution that really speaks to all these, you know, ethos that we're speaking to? And so we decided to work with Entheogen. And, you know, um, I, I have another organization, a nonprofit that uh, the name is Entheogenic Research Integration Education. And I watch people stumble over the word all the time, entheogen, and, you know, all the different ways that people kind of stumble over the word. 
But now it's in policy all over the place. And people, I've even heard reporters saying it right. And, you know, people that you wouldn't expect to, they're on, they're, they're saying it right. So, so I think, you know, just in terms of like, there's lots of layers to what we're doing. Policy is obviously one of them. Changing the paradigm, changing the conversation, using new words and language is another part of that. And so to really be able to get the word entheogen, really speaking to these as being sacred experiences uh, into policy all across the U.S. is pretty impressive, in my opinion. And uh, and just as a lead up to what Carlos is going to speak to, you know, I think one thing there to remember is that, you know, there are cultures all across the world that have worked with this. And the term indigenous is kind of a, a monolithic term and it misses the fact that there's a richness in cultures all, all across the planet. You know, for example, there's probably 120 different groups uh, in, in the Amazon that uh, or in the Amazon region that uh, work with ayahuasca. And each of them have different cosmologies and different understandings, you know. Uh, with some traditions, not necessarily with ayahuasca, but other entheogenic traditions, some people go clockwise around the fire, other people go counterclockwise around the fire. So uh, there's a lot of different sort of understandings of this in terms of the medicine work, but I'll let Carlos speak to it a little bit more. About it. Yeah, I think, uh, well, first, the thanks, Larry. When we were considering, do we use the term psychedelic? I think there were a number of people in the room, particularly, you know, including myself, who felt like it didn't really represent where we came from, where I came from psychedelics was really interwoven with things like PCP, heroin, things you went to prison for, which is why I didn't try it till I was 48, because a lot of people in my um, background, family, uh, went to prison, died from heroin, were arrested, you know, cop brutality, whatever, all that stuff in our community. And so I tended to stay away from, you know, the drugs that could be on weed and uh, other mild stuff, uh, I stayed away from those. And so psychedelic really for people of color uh, in, in marginalized communities in the U.S. is not really what it is in, say, what it was in, during um, the 70s for many people in Golden Gate Park. Uh, so we wanted a term that would be much more um, friendly towards um, other cultures, but particularly uh, ancient traditions. And um, you know, the, the concept of indigenous worldview, which we've endorsed as a board, encouraging people to really understand their own indigenous worldview from their own ancestry. So going back to the Celtic days, if you're, you know, from, from Northern Europe to, to um, the, the pagans, uh, other groups, and then, of course, the existing indigenous throughout the world, and really understand how our ancestors would have seen the world back when we were more connected to the ecosystem. Uh, and we understood that what we did affected everything around us. Westernism has really been about reduction, reducing everything, including our own relationship to each other and to the world, where we've now become isolated with this single ego uh, disassociated from everything else. And uh, but but the indigenous worldview is really more about stillness and recognizing the interconnectedness uh, and, and inviting people to reconnect with that concept. There's a term going around right now, um, called the indigenous way of knowing, which refers to that there are all these other ways of interpreting the world. Uh, we get stuck in this idea that how I see the world is how everyone else sees it, but there's such amazing, beautiful diversity in how people see the world, every human in their own universe. And it's really about allowing that to emerge to help us heal our relationship with each other and the planet. I like to think it's more indigenous way of being, which it's more about that stillness in which you feel interconnected with the ecosystem as opposed to constantly being in your thoughts, knowing, knowing things, having to know things, which detaches us uh, oftentimes. So we wanted to honor that. And the term entheogen was uh, generic enough, uh, was um, with some meaning about sacred and wisdom and the inner experience. Uh, that uh, we felt it was the right term to use. It leaves a lot of space for all the many uh, worldviews to emerge, and it honors all the people who've been doing a lot of work with entheogens all over the world, not just today, but a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, including everybody's ancestry that's here on this call. Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, can you? Um... I'm going to kind of go through a list of some of the common um, compounds within some of these uh, natural um, plants and fungi. Um, so it, uh, I'll kind of go down the line. And if you could kind of give us some of the uh, medicinal or spiritual significance to these and maybe how they occur in nature. Um, first of all, I would like to start with DMT. Sure. Um, so DMT is a short-acting tryptamine. Uh, typically, it lasts about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, uh, this is found uh, 
all over the place. I'm sure if anyone uh, online wants to look into it, DMT is is everywhere, you know, which is also a very interesting. Why is DMT everywhere? <laughs> you know, it's a great question to ask, right? Um, but uh, but you can find DMT in different types of grasses, different types of trees, different types of uh, you know seeds. Um, you can you know DMT is one of the um, uh, sort of uh, main main uh, psychoactive components in ayahuasca. So ayahuasca is basically a modulation of DMT and uh, by MAOI. So if you were to sort of uh, drink DMT, you would have no experience uh, because for whatever reason, and this is also maybe because it's so much in the environment, you know, there's some speculation that, you know, if we were always constantly eating DMT and <laughs> tripping every 15 minutes, we wouldn't be able to survive really well, right? So our, our bellies metabolize that really easily. So um, so what ends up happening is ayahuasca is a combination of DMT and a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. So the MAOI or monoamine oxidase inhibitor inhibits um, sort of the belly metabolites, if you will, so that it won't actually be broken down and the DMT can actually reach uh, you and have the experience. So an ayahuasca experience is like four to six hours and it's uh, sort of like stretches out the DMT experience. Um, in terms of DMT, there's a lot of, you know, interesting research out there, um, you know, Obviously, personal and spiritual growth is a big one. Um, but, you know, when you're talking about any kind of change or transformation in life, and this is something I studied in my dissertation, um, we're talking about quick and sudden shifts or the what this quantum change. So uh, there's this idea that, you know, in certain experiences, let's say somebody was had, was drinking a lot and they want to sort of stop drinking and they have a big profound experience. The DMT might actually be like helping with the drinking per se. But what it does do is it shifts the person and then sort of according to this theory is that it shifts the person to a new identity, a new paradigm, a new thought of understanding. So they don't even need to change their behavior to stop drinking. They just are no longer a drinker. And so it like shifts their understanding of the world and, and how to be in it. So, so there's a lot of benefits that aren't really being studied yet by kind of the, the typical science out there because they're not thinking on these like larger scales or just looking very much like this thing works for this thing, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a big question to ask. Why is it helping with depression? Why is it helping with anxiety? Why is it helping with PTSD? And it's really about this mind expansion, this exploration of consciousness and opportunity to sort of uh, rewrite our own narratives or to see something in a different lens or a different perspective. And I think that's a really big part of what DMT and other things are doing. So though you'll see research out there saying it's good for X, Y, Z, but you know, oftentimes at the bottom of that is personal and spiritual growth. Yeah, I I, I agree with that. Um, I see a lot of uh, a lot of people in my community who are kind of suffering uh, with dependencies for whatever reason that led them down that path. And uh, people are finding um, a new path and a new way of thinking, and uh, it's helping out a lot. Um, can you go ahead and speak to the difference between DMT and uh, the 5-MeO DMT and how 5-MeO DMT is accessed in nature? Sure. Um, so, <clears throat> so I have never actually... so. <laughs> A lot of these experiences, it's hard, hard to really talk about what it is unless you've had the experience, right? Or know somebody really well that's had the experience. I haven't had a breakthrough 5-MeO DMT experiences, although I've had a lot of DMT experiences. Um, what I understand the difference to be is DMT is very much kind of like the jungle. <laughs> you know, it's very tight and compact visions. And 5-MeO DMT might be like where you would find the Sonoran Desert Toad, which is well, one of the places that 5-MeO DMT comes from just kind of a little more expansive. It's sort of this singular sort of point of light and people have some really profound spiritual experiences with 5-MeO DMT. But the toad isn't the only place that you can find it. There's also lots of plants that have it. Uh, there's a, a snuff, I believe, called Lenanthina. I believe that has 5-MeO DMT in it. And there's even some plants that like switch over seasons uh, from DMT to 5-MeO DMT, which is also fascinating. Why does that happen? I don't know. But, um, but there are plants, there are a lot of plants out there that have 5-MeO DMT as well. Yeah, and I think it's uh, I think it's kind of uh, I think it's kind of cool that you know all over the world and all over in nature there are these compounds that are kind of uh, there for us to access and to use to uh, maybe experience things and feel things in a way we never have before. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, psilocybin? Uh, where it's uh, where it's naturally found and some of the uh, benefits of, of of taking psilocybin. Yeah, so psilocybin probably has the most research right now. Um, actually, I just uh, saw an article today in CNN that they're actually starting to shift how they talk about it, maybe because of the success of the decriminalized nature movement. 
But they used to always just say, oh, magic, we're, we're studying magic mushrooms. And these pharma companies are talking about studying magic mushrooms, but they're not. They're talking about psilocybin, which is a synthetic compound from a magic mushroom, right? So now they're starting to talk about synthetic magic mushrooms, right? Because they have to they have to differentiate, right? So so when we're talking about mushrooms, uh, sort of like the Cubenzies, for example, um, and this is uh, research even that's been done by Paul Stamets and others, uh, there's basically four psychoactive components in uh, the Cubenzies mushrooms, which would be the, the psilocybin, the, uh, the psilocin, the baocysteine and the norbaocysteine. Now we don't really know what the norbaocysteine and the baocysteine uh, does. Some, you know, Paul Stamets, I believe, had some research that was looking at it maybe being slightly anti-anxiety and those different types of things. But there's basically four different psychoactive um, parts to a uh, mushroom um, that don't come in the the, the um, psilocybin pill, so to speak. I guess maybe down the road, pharma would love to have four different pills to give you, but you might as well just grow your own mushrooms at that point, right? So, uh, yeah, so, really. <laughs> so, uh, so, but but that's where the research is right now. So there's lots of research, for example, uh, treatment-resistant depression, uh, end-of-life anxiety, um, uh, what do you call, um, you know, PTSD, a cessation of smoking, uh, all these different things. There's quite a bit, you know, unfortunately, we're in a space now where there's a lot of um, public companies out there that are saying they're going to do all this big research but there's not really so much evidence there. And then you have some research universities that are doing peer reviewed journal papers. But uh, one, one challenge with that, you know, and, and of course this is uh, the problem with Western science, speaking about these sort of entheogenic or sacred plants and mushrooms or psychedelic plants and mushrooms is this idea of the double blind fallacy, which is the idea that no matter what, um, somebody's gonna know when they're having the experience. You know, the double blind is supposed to mean you're not supposed to know that if you're having the experience or not. So you can't sort of, you know, influence the end result. But as soon as somebody has the experience, they're like, oh, yes, I know. And chances are the person that's sitting in the room also is like, oh, yeah, they're having an experience right now. Right. And they haven't quite figured out how to sort of, sort of solve that problem. So a lot of the, the science that, out, is that that is out there is sort of, you know, doesn't have the same sort of um, methodological rigor as other studies do because of that issue around the double blind placebo fallacy. But um, but either way, we're seeing it in, in community all over the place. We're seeing public health benefits. We're seeing people talk about their healing. We're seeing people in, you know, communities across the world that have been working with this. And mushrooms grow everywhere. Um, you know, not just, uh, you know, there's sort of, we know them here um, from the Mazatec tradition. Um, um, but, uh, but you know, they they're, they're, they grow wild everywhere. So to assume that people aren't just, you know, over time picking them and eating them out of the ground, I think is, is silly. You know, there's uh, some interesting uh, I saw some meme or something out there recently that was like, you know, uh, imagine how our ancestors had to come across these different mushrooms, right? Well, this one tastes like beef and this one killed Joe and this one made me see God for three days, you know? So there's a whole <laughs> process around trying to figure out trial and error of being like, are these safe to eat or not safe to eat? And, you know, sort of our ancestors really work with these plants. So, um, so it's from there comes a lot of different uh, interesting traditions. You know, it's, it's fascinating, for example, that the Mazatec tradition will use honey and cocoa beans to work with the mushrooms, to eat with the mushrooms. And now we know that um, cocoa beans or chocolate has a monoamine oxidase inhibitor in there. So it's very similar to the reaction that would happen with ayahuasca. So you're sort of modulating the mushroom experiences with an MAOI. So um, so lots of really fascinating. And, and you know, there's not like modern day chemistry in those communities, but they understood that these relationships with plants go well beyond what we understand. Yeah, and I think a lot of that a lot of that knowledge is being lost over time. And then we have to use our methods of science to try to rediscover or try to make sense of something that has been over evolutionary time kind of figured out. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so um, while we're on the subject of um, magic mushrooms, I'll kind of skip ahead. Uh, Muscamol is in the Amanita. Um, and I listened to um, I listened to Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia about this subject, and he said that the muscimol in Amanita is similar to like what a Lunesta or an Ambien would be. Uh, can mm -hmm. you kind of speak about muscimol a little bit? Yeah, so um, I don't know much about it in terms of Ambien or any of that kind of thing. Of course, Hamilton Morris is he's always going to relate it to a pharmaceutical, right? Of course, that's his thing, right? He works with Compass Pathways now, which is uh, uh, was uh, trying to patent psilocybin back in the day, or still is trying to work on that. So um, very interesting there. But uh, but muscimol is definitely uh, something that needs to be um, you know really a lot of care needs to be done around it. I know if you just have the the amanita mushroom by itself, there might be some toxicity to it. But oddly enough, amanita mushrooms are legal. There's no law against them. 
right? Which is if you have something that's actually a little bit higher risk with no law against it, but for some reason this loss to be mushrooms, it's against the law. So uh, just sort of an odd thing there. <laughs> and um, and um, in terms of the experience, I, I hear it is kind of like a deeper sort of dreamy type experience. So maybe that's what he's speaking to about Ambien, maybe not as visual, but again, I haven't had the experience myself, so I'm not as qualified to be able to speak to the inner experience there. Well, I can tell you that um, I'm in the Pacific Northwest and um, around our golf courses are a lot of pine trees. And so the Amanitas grow uh, crazy there. And um, when we were younger teenagers, we would pick them thinking that they were like Liberty caps or azorescents that we have in the area. And we would eat them. And it was definitely not the same kind of experience. And of course, I was trying to tell people, hey, be careful, you know, because back, you know, back then we were always taught that this was a toxic thing. It'll kill you. Don't eat it. And then I have a bunch of my friends sitting here munching down on Amanita caps. And I'm thinking, oh, great, this can go very bad. Uh, but it ended up being fine. Um, everybody was fine. It, um, and so I was going to mention about cannabinoids, but I think that's kind of an obvious thing. So I'm going to go ahead and jump to mescaline. And if you could speak about uh, mescaline and its spiritual significance and also its medicinal uh, uh, properties as well. Sure. Yeah. So mescaline is uh, contained in cacti. Uh, it's a, it's unlike the other um, substances you mentioned, which are tryptamines. Uh, mescaline is a phenethylamine. <clears throat> so in the family, it's more related to like an MDMA than it is to like an ayahuasca or a mushroom. Um, it is, uh, you know, I have this idea, I don't know if you've heard of the doctrine of signatures before, where a plant will sort of show you what it's good for. So like certain plants that look like a liver is good for the liver, certain plants that looks like a heart is good for the heart, certain plants is good for, so I have this sort of uh, internal theory uh, that uh, that the visions of the experience is very much like the environment it's in. So for example, the ayahuasca is very much like a jungle, it's really tight. You know, the visions are like, right? Like I was saying with the DMT earlier, um, but mescaline and mescaline containing cacti, it's very open and spacious. You know, it's like twinklies and stars and it feels like you're in a desert and it feels like you're in a space where, um, you know, these sort of plants grow. So um, so that comes from, uh, from I think, about 100 different cacti that contain mescaline. Uh, probably the ones that your uh, audience is more familiar with is the Wachuma, San Pedro, um, the, the Trichosaurus, that type of thing, and then also the peyote cacti. Um, these have been used medicinally for, I think, the, the biggest thing that people are speaking to right now in terms of a, a quote-unquote medical function would be uh, for um, alcohol. Um, substance uh, issues, um, but a lot of more of what it is really about a personal spiritual experience. And a lot of these, again, that's what you're going to boil down to at the end of it. Now, I noticed that um, one of the one of the effects when uh, uh, many of these substances are coming on, like uh, psilocybin, mescaline, and uh, um, like uh, ayahuasca and DMT, um, is the puking and the physical purge that you kind of go through as that whole uh, experience is beginning. Um, are there are there a, a connection with that purge between these kind of uh, substances, or is it just kind of like random that that's kind of what happens? Um, I mean, you know, I, I hear more purging with ayahuasca than the other ones. Um, maybe some with mescaline containing cacti, but that might also be a byproduct of the flavor. So these are not the most flavorful things. You're definitely not giving this out uh, as yeah. candy for Halloween. You know? So right. <laughs> parents don't worry about your candy bags. You'll be good here. Um, but anyway, <laughs> so, um, but, uh, but uh, um, you know, I think that the ayahuasca, you know, part of the traditional understanding of that, which is also, again, speaking to the, 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 the dynamic with science and ancient wisdom. Uh, ancient wisdom is that these um, materials help basically sort of get rid of all of your junk, right? And so that purging process is a process of getting rid of the stuff that's holding you back or that's making you unhealthy or what have you. Um, and some of the science that we see right now, there's actually some studies that are trying to say, uh, if somebody purges do, during a, a paper or excuse me, uh, during an experience, they're gonna exclude that data. But that's like probably to some people, it's one of the most important parts of it. Yeah. So, so there is definitely a connection between purging and healing, at least in the ayahuasca understanding, um, in the, the sort of mescaline understanding or the mushroom, you know, mushroom, I see a lot of people get belly aches, sometimes people purge, but maybe less so, mescaline maybe a little bit more because you got to, you know, deal with the flavor, all that type of thing, but ayahuasca is the one that you really hear about purging the most. Yeah, I, I know, like, uh, when I would pick mushrooms, uh, often I would kind of vomit 
or maybe get some diarrhea at first. And then it would kind of go away. And then the whole experience would kind of unfold. Um, you had mentioned some a little bit about end of life and palliative care. Uh, can you talk about the mind body spirit connection and the uh, and the application of these plants and fungi in palliative care? Sure, uh, I, Carlos. You, I've just been going off here, Carlos. If you want to jump in on anything, just let me know. But uh, maybe I'll jump in this palliative care real quick. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of interesting research about it, and again, this is again what's fascinating about how these plants and mushrooms are bringing a different conversation into science. So for example, what's really happening at palliative care? It's not about, they're not gonna make themselves better per se. They're not gonna not be in a terminal situation after it, but what they're really trying to look at is uh, anxiety around passing. And that's a spiritual question. That's an existential question. That's a question about consciousness. Where do I go? What happens when I die? And that's the, the big issue that people are having uh, when they get into that space. And also, like, how do I heal, make amends with my family? How do I make sure that I don't carry this over? How do I make sure that everyone's in a good space? So there's even some studies. I'm not sure how many are out there, but I saw some people talking about not only for the individual who's in palliative care, but also for the family members, maybe have um, joint journeys or joint ceremonies so they can all kind of heal together. I did have a really fascinating conversation. Granted, this conversation was about um, ketamine for end-of-life anxiety. But I was talking to a hospice person, and they made a really good point, is really the timing of this whole issue. Um, she was saying that she thinks hospice is maybe too late, and that palliative care might be the best spot. She, the reason for her saying that is she thinks like, well, if you have a big, expansive, you know, mind paradigm shattering experience, and you're five days away from passing away, how do you ground that? How, you know, you're kind of in, you're already dealing with the biggest question of our life, which is death. And now you're sort of laying on top of it, all these um, sort of deep, spiritual experiences and maybe it changes your whole paradigm maybe you're like oh i made all these mistakes in life what do i do about it and so it can put people in sort of a stressful zone so she, so her recommendation was to stick with the palliative time frame which is before hospice and actually let people sort of be able to work with that material before they end up passing kind of process everything and come to terms with what they're experiencing yeah all right, well, I have one more kind of uh, in the nature realm of things, and then we'll kind of start talking about decriminalization versus legalization and stuff uh, like that. But uh, my last question is, um, are there new and exciting plants and fungi being discovered that also have these kind of uh, experiences attached with them and maybe new compounds uh, that we have never even heard of before? So, yeah, I mean, I think, discovered is maybe a, a term that I wouldn't use because they exist. We just don't even know it. You know, there's this idea of plant blindness, right? There's plants all around us that we don't even realize have all these components in it. For example, here in the Bay Area, uh, star jasmine has ibogaine in it. And people throw away star jasmine in landscaping trucks. It's considered an invasive species, you know? So there's plants all over the place that actually have these components in them, but maybe we're just not familiar with them. Another uh, interesting, uh, um, I, I guess it's on the DMT nexus, they were talking about, you know, who's the biggest DMT producer in the world? It turns out it's, it's citrus farms <clears throat> because all the leaves of the citrus plants have some, some DMT in it. So exactly, we just don't even really realize it. And we need to study plants. And again, this is why looking back to nature, instead of saying, oh, we need to synthesize this thing. We don't even know what, you know, it seems like we need to go out in space, but we don't even know what's in the water and the oceans. We haven't even explored that yet, you know? So same sort of thing. We don't, necessarily need to be making new synthetics when we have all these things in the natural environment that are already there. Uh, I, you know, some of the more unusual ones, uh, you know, if you're like a sponge that has like a, like a, a marine sponge or a water sponge that has uh, some DMT in it. Um, you know, obviously there's quite some, quite a few plants like the, for example, the DMT and the 5-MeO DMT plant that switches back and forth. That's pretty interesting. I don't know the name of that one, unfortunately, but there's a lot of plants out there that can, um, you know, provide these uh, compounds. And also, you know, I mean, there's probably, you know, I think somebody did the math, close to 4,000 different combinations of plants that can contain something or create something similar to ayahuasca when you have the DMT and the MAOI. Now, from our perspective, we're just like, okay, there's 4,000 options for, for ayahuasca. But from, from a more interesting perspective is if ayahuasca has a spirit, then there's 3,999 other spirits out there 
that we haven't connected with, that we haven't built a relationship, that we still don't know what it's all about. We still don't know what that consciousness is like. So if we think about it sort of in this broader spectrum as it, it, as plants having consciousness, as mushrooms having consciousness, and this is a relationship or a conversation that we're having, just like with cannabis, we're having a relationship or a conversation with it, then it's going to kind of uh, change the dynamic. Maybe, you know, there's different plants that do different things. And so, um, so I think that's another question that we'll start to see emerge over time as people become more familiar with these plants and really start developing new relationships with them. Very good, very good. Um, okay, so we're gonna kind of try to uh, shift gears a little bit. And um, would you, would some one of you uh, like to explain the difference uh, between legalization and decriminalization? I think people often don't understand uh, the difference and what those mean. There, you want me to take this one? Um, so the, the best way, easiest way to understand it for me is uh, to think about uh, decriminalization as uh, your inherent right to engage with nature uh, doesn't require any kind of government or corporate uh, sanction. Uh, you can grow your own tomatoes, you can breathe the air, you can grow your own oranges. Um, and, uh, and so decriminalization is really about liberating the plant medicines uh, so you can grow them, gather them, um, share them, have a big feast with whatever you're growing with your friends. And, um, and as long as you're not engaging in any kind of um, uh, sales activity or regulated production, then um, that's decriminalization. And by design, if you really want to decriminalize something, you can't add limits to it. Because once you start adding limits to it, now you create an arrestable threshold. Uh, so I like to call um, when, when people advocate, uh, usually it's corporate um, ad advocates, uh, corporate lobbyists adv advocate for decriminalization. But with limits, it's really modified criminalization is what we're talking about because you're still going to arrest people for uh, exceeding that threshold. So we oppose any limits on decriminalization for it to truly remain true decriminalization. Once you start getting into a legal relationship with the government, that is you're selling, you're fabricating, you need to get permission for, uh, from any kind of state or federal or even county regulatory agency uh, to, uh, to cultivate, to sell, uh, you need a business license, taxation, any of that. Now you're entering into a legalization framework. And the, the reason that we're really uh, trepidatious about legalization frameworks is because it primary, primarily happens at the state and federal level. And here in the United States, as in most Western countries, um, uh, politicians are generally um, funded by, at the state and federal level, special interests and corporate lobbyists or corporate interests. And what that does is it sets up a situation where a legal framework, the actual laws will be written by lobbyists associated with corporate interests, which is which are really motivated by profiteering. So we've um, really um, stuck to the plan of uh, pushing decriminalization because at the end of the day, that's the primary way where we're going to be able to enjoy the abundance of nature uh, and uh, share it amongst ourselves in a way where we can actually cooperate around medicines as opposed to it becoming a big competitive thing as happened with cannabis. So we've learned a lot of lessons from cannabis uh, by being in it. Um, I, I guess I was in it since 2002 as a regulator and then a lobbyist and then a permit holder and then just got out of it because it went so dark, um, so much greed and, and just you know, the dark side of humanity came out with cannabis. Um, and, um, and so trying to prevent that from happening with plant medicines, we really are advocating decriminalization, but at the local level, because at the local level is where you can still exercise uh, some level of control over the outcome of your, um, uh, of your legislative proposals, because we can still build a relationship at the local level with city council members. Uh, typically at the local level, corporate corporations haven't bought off local politicians or um, county politicians, because there's so much accessibility to um, local elected officials, they certainly will try, but um, local um, residents still have the opportunity to organize and, uh, and make a big impact and power at the local level. So that's the area where we have a lot of control still over what policies we push, and we've in that way pushed uh, 15 resolutions to pass. 
And the basic idea is that the more cities that we pass, the more that we're building power collectively in a decentralized way with leaders all over the place pushing for this vision, this ethos of decriminaliz decriminalization. Um, it, and we build power around the concept of just removing any penalties whatsoever and any need to participate in a legal framework for those of us who don't want to participate in a, in a legal regulatory framework. So that's, that's the basis of the movement. And the more cities we win, then the more power we build. And then eventually the idea is just to remove these from schedule one and, and then not just in the US, but around the world, uh, start to basically shift the narrative one for where these have to be criminalized to where they should all be decriminalized. Yeah, that's good. I mean, we need that. I mean, people need safe access. Uh, and a lot of people are under the assumption that uh, safe access means legalization. And so a lot of these uh, legislative bills and stuff uh, come before people and they're so eager uh, to get some kind of safe access that they'll vote in these horrific laws and subject themselves to uh, what I consider to be uh, non-productive uh, ways of accessing uh, this plant and the fungi. Um, and now- Can I order... comment on that safe access issue you raised real quick? Yeah. Sure. So uh, the idea that um, safe access, for many people still think safe access means medicalization or sticking it within a Western framework of medicalization or therapeutic clinics. Um, but what's really interesting is that you don't have a lot of articles. You know, there's very few articles before even 1970, Richard Nixon's War on Drugs, very little information that you can find about people having emergency situations or major deaths or big crisis situations around these plant medicines. Uh, and however, um, during COVID, there were over 90,000 deaths of, with opiates, uh, associated with opiates. Uh, in a one year time period. So we've kind of been somewhat uh, indoctrinated, not somewhat indoctrinated, extremely indoctrinated to think that the Western model is actually safer, uh, yet we have so many deaths because of opiates that have been approved by the FDA and are now out in the uh, world. Um, and, and yet we let that pass by without questioning the entire pharmaceutical slash governmental relationship and the relationship between the FDA and the pharmaceutical companies and the infiltration of lobbyists and the infiltration of corporate power and all of the unsafe conditions that creates. And we just sort of assume because, because it's medical that it's safe. Um, but we would, we would conjecture that the safest way for people to engage with plant medicines is directly as nat in natural form in community with uh, people around you who have maybe had some journeys who can help advise. You can do it by yourself, you can do it with other people, but you know, do seek information from the internet and from people around you. And that's probably about as safe as it's gonna get. Um, and, and safe as defined, not just, you know, I'm not gonna have a seizure, I'm not gonna have some you know, death or major psychological harm, but safe also in the sense that no one is trying to uh, insert meaning into your meaning making when you're having some kind of spiritual uh, experience with these, because you could go into a situation where you're having a really important journey. It may be challenging, but it's important that you get through it. And then you seek advice through integration, um, you know, circles and, and advice from friends. But then if you have a therapist and that is not to critique therapists and doctors, but I'm critiquing the entire Western framework model um, that someone is going to insert into your brain what meaning you're supposed to make of that who has very little experience with these plant medicines. And, and that's also unsafe because it could send you on a trajectory of, you know, nihilist self, self annihilating thought, dark thoughts, self blame, all of these uh, things that uh, people in our society struggle with. Uh, GR, yeah. I wanted to uh, jump in uh, with a question. Um, from that kind of was inspired from chat, uh, from the live chat. Um, and also just thank everyone. Thank obviously our, our two, uh, guests tonight. We really appreciate their time. They've been on with us for about 46 minutes so far. So thanks so much, Larry and Carlos. It's been super interesting, super fascinating to learn about all of this. Um, and I want to thank all of our listeners and our viewers tonight who have been, uh, watching us live. And if you're, viewing or listening to this in the future. Thanks for listening and, and uh, make sure to subscribe for more of this sort of stuff.
But um, my question, Carlos and Larry, and I, I think especially Carlos, given your your background um, in, in politics and working at a local level, and and um, is how can people get involved? You know, how to how if people want to make change and they don't live in as liberal of an area like the San Francisco Bay Area or whatever. Um, and there might not be local politicians that are even hip to this kind of stuff. How can people get involved and make a change where they live? Yeah, thanks. Well, the, the, thank you. Uh, the first thing is, re regardless of where you live, um, there are other people like you who want to liberate and be liberated. And people get hung up sometimes on that um, that uh, that that moment when you when you win a resolution victory, right? And so if you don't, if you're not marching towards that in a in a in a quick way toward getting a resolution in front of council, and you don't have it scheduled, and then then people feel like I'm not doing anything. But if you think about it, we're in it for the long game, right? Because we have two thousand years at least plus of, of indoctrination of, of of human consciousness towards the narrowing of human human awareness. Fear has become much more of a thing uh, that guides us than it did maybe 3,000 years ago as a species. And this is all part of just operating in this world of, of you know, falsely created scarcity. Um, and so um, the, the, the idea is it's not going to happen overnight that we liberate ourselves, that we liberate these plant medicines. It's going to take time. But that whole process of education that any of your listeners can get involved in just calling meetings in, in, a, in, in your community and finding the two or three people, even if you're in an area that is you know, tough on drugs and sees everything that affects consciousness as a drug, uh, even if you're in those areas that are more conservative perhaps on the topic, you can still find two or three people. And then you meet and you make it six or eight people. And then you make it 15 or 20. And then you find someone in the city nearby and then you have a little get together and conference. And then you maybe meet with a council member in your area and you educate them. And so it just takes a little bit more time. And we encourage people to really think about this as an a, a object, objective of lifetimes. But the healing for each of us is in the walk. Uh, it's in doing the work, right? It's not in the victory because you have a victory and you're like, okay, now what? But it's in doing the walk of liberation of yourself and of others where you are healing yourself uh, from all of this sense of desperation all this sense of disconnection and that you can't make a difference in the world. And so when you, when you talk to somebody and you, you're seeing the change happen and you're seeing it in their eyes, it affects you in a good way. So that I would say to them, you know, contact us and we give all the information for free. We'll sit, Larry and I will sit and, uh, and do um, trainings about how to do these uh, education things and how to change minds of elected officials. And then just get out and do the walk, you know, call a meeting. And sometimes people are afraid. They don't want to step out and, you know, do what you two are doing because it's kind of scary. But uh, we got to get past that fear again and start talking to each other in community. It's easy now with Instagram. We help you. You send us, a, a you know, your announcement. We post it on our national Instagram. We have 72,000 followers, likely someone in your city. So it's not hard to get engaged and make change. Um, the biggest thing is just be patient and do it for for this for the the sake of the walk, not for the victory, inevitable right. victory. If victory happens, that's great, but it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. just, oh, oh, sorry. Yep, no problem. Just to add to that too. Um, if people do want to contact us, decriminalizednature.org is our website. Uh, the Instagram account that Carlos was talking about is at decriminalizednature. Uh, so contact us there. We'd be happy to reach out. And I think one thing that I've been pleasantly surprised by. As you are saying, you know, the, Carlos is saying there's a whole wide range of people out there. And what we just need to do is education. We found that this conversation really transcends politics. You know, it doesn't matter what side of the aisle on, what side of, you know, who you are as an individual. If you bring this education, everyone knows somebody that's, you know, could be benefiting from this. Um, and I've been more than, more than surprised more than once of how many times there's been a city council member or an elected official who's very familiar with this research. And, you know, I always tell people, you just don't know, there might be a city council member just waiting for you to ask. You know, not something that they can put forward, but if their constituents come forward and bring it to them, they can move this forward. And so there's just a lot of support, not just on the ground, but also in city councils across the U.S. And we just got to find those spots. And we have teams, I think there's about 50 or 60 teams across the U.S. right now in all different locations from Texas to Oklahoma to, you know, Colorado to Montana, all up and down the West Coast, all in the Midwest. Michigan has had a lot of passing that happened out there. Uh, we have a great team that's happening in Atlanta. 
um, you know, places that we wouldn't necessarily expect to move this forward so quickly. They're doing really great education, uh, talking to people. And, you know, at the end of the day, we all want uh, healing for our community. And I think that's something that really sort of resonates, especially when you hear people's testimonials of transformation, uh, how they, you know, many people say, I wouldn't be here today without having had these experiences and those different types of things. Those are powerful narratives to bring forward. Yeah, I, I guess I just wanted to make a real quick comment, too, is just um, encourage anyone that wants to get involved to um, just be persistent and don't give up. It can be really hard to organize and get people to show up to your meeting or whatever. You know, people don't want to show up to stuff or, you know, especially if it's brand new and whatever. Like it can, all this stuff is a, is a it takes some time and persistence. And then it's also going to take time and persistence to build those relationships with your council members or whatever it may be and get them to listen to you. And it'll probably take, I imagine, multiple meetings or at least touch points with these folks until they end up, you know, potentially voting in your favor. Um, I don't know if Carlos or Larry, you guys want to speak to that, but I just, you know, where I live in Vallejo, which is a little bit north of you guys, I've seen how things have gone in our city council meetings and i've seen some people get stuff passed but it took them like a year of kind of meeting with city council members and kind of greasing the wheels so to speak not in a negative way just like building that conversation and that um that uh relationship until the actual vote ended up happening i don't know if you guys want to speak to that at all sure yeah and the, the you know the what we try to do with all the victories that we do have is make it easier for folks who live in more um, in less progressive areas with respect to, to uh, plant medicines or drug policy like Vallejo. Um, and so that you can build on the victories of say recently San Francisco and then your council members are hearing this and they're like, oh, okay, it's not some wacko thing. The council members are the supervisors from San Francisco just passed this. Um, and then to couch this in the sort of larger political economy, why it's so important for people to get engaged, uh, to go slightly off track, but then bring us back. You know, Post-World War II, there was this whole movement with, with the neoclassical uh, economics with you know, Milton Friedman and folks like um, James Buchanan, who were really aggressive um, uh, economists who understood that by manipulating people's consciousness, minds, paradigms, you can start to empower that, that mechanism that was allowing the US to sort of have its way around the world, which was the corporate entity. And it was a, a direct attack on our democracy. And it was the intention was to diminish the power of the voter, the engagement of the voter, the participation of the voter. And they made a bunch of changes within Congress. And you see that attacks on voting rights acts and disempowerment of people and cutting of, of, of social support systems. But it really manifested most aggressively in Citizens United where corporations became humans, although you know not human enough to mourn the death of a loved one, not human enough to um, be taken to jail, um, but human enough to be able to control politics through donations, right? Um, and so th that entire system of control of our federal, state, now international global politics is contingent on people not participating. So to the extent that you want some control in your life, this is where antiogens are wonderful because it, you realize, wait a second, we're all co-creating this, this reality together, which means I have power in it. If I step out of my lethargy, out of my apathy, out of my cynicism and just take action, I can actually uh, help change the world. And, and you can, and it, but it starts with just believing that you can and then taking the next step. And you all, people like you, Sam and JR, like you all are so important in this to help people do that. So this is why whenever we're asked on a podcast, Larry and I always show up because really you guys having the courage to step forward and hold these forums uh, is, is, is a good way of engaging your base to, to get out and take action. Well, I think we're, yeah. uh, we're really fortunate here in cannabis um, uh, because we are not a corporate owned entity. Um, we don't have the same community guidelines that all the other corporate media platforms have. So we have an opportunity to truly serve our community. And the idea of these cannabis sessions is to bring people on that can help educate people. Because I think like you said, our minds have been so conformed into this way of thinking that looking outside the box is not only difficult, but sometimes out of the realm of understanding. 
So I think having folks like you on, uh, having people come on and start speaking to uh, these, um, speaking to these uh, different communities and platforms, um, I think it's very important. And I think that, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a thing that me and Sam have both really doubled down on, I would say within the last six months or so in the creation of Cannabis Sessions. We really yeah. want to give folks such as yourself uh, a chance to come on and educate people and teach people uh, you know, what, what the reality of the situation is. And kind of speaking to that, uh, recently uh, in the news, of course, right before uh, the election season, uh, we had uh, the current administration kind of come out and in my opinion, kind of pander to our community and uh, announce these pardons uh, for federal possession um, can you kind of speak to what that really accomplishes and the difference between uh, pardons and expungement? <laughs> yeah, sweet. All right. So, uh, so yeah, so no, I, I'm in agreement with you and, and your community in that. And, you know, it's like, <clears throat> it felt very much like an optics issue. You know, we're going to, um, you know, release people uh, or pardon people for, um, for, you know, personal possession on the federal level. Well, nobody very, you know, I think with the 6,000 people total uh, were, were involved with that, but then it doesn't include all the other things that often get tagged on. It's all, you know, federal, um, you know, jail time for personal possession is small comparatively to all the other things that are tapped into that, like, you know, conspiracy or, you know, selling or all the other things that can happen there. So, so it's a very small number. Um, and then I think, you know, the, the challenge there is it's, uh, you know, it's like, if it's just as easy to do that, there should be just as easy to decriminalize it. And they're still waiting and spending their time waiting, waiting, waiting on that. Um, you know, and I think there's a lot of lobbyists out there that are also, you know, taking control of that. So um, it's unfortunate to see, you know, we've been promised, you know, for many, 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 many years now that things would change on the federal level. And that was one of Biden's, um, you know, campaign promises uh, in, ter in terms of this too, in terms of getting this decriminalized and they're still, really, we're still not seeing it. So, um, so that's really disappointing. And then of course, you know, uh, in terms of a, a pardon or an expungement, I guess a pardon would be, um, you know, um, getting, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong on this, Carlos, uh, getting people out, you know, of jail and then expungement. I think there's also amnesty, which is slightly different, but expungement would be like, you know, um, uh, sort of uh, you know, getting the record cleared, but it's still in the computer system. It still shows that there's been an arrest, that type of thing. Um, and then, um, uh, but but neither of these things are really something that you know is is, is really helping the scenario. Uh, and also, people are oftentimes in jail for statewide things. So um, so you know um, you know it'd be much nicer to see him kind of do a bigger um, sort of push. Uh, you know, it's funny we have uh, uh, this expungement issue came up on uh, SB 509, which is uh, some state uh, California ballot initiative. Um, or excuse me, not ballot initiative, but uh, um, legislation that came through that was going to decriminalize um, um, you know uh, empty gins and some psychedelics as well. And they had the expungement issue in there, and that got dropped in the first uh, appropriations committee um, because they said it was too high of a cost, you know. And so this is something that's you know kind of odd to think about, you know, like well, it's like going to be ten million dollars to get people these people out of jail, so we're going to keep them in jail because it'll cost us less. But we're, we're talking about, and again, this is this is the the world we the world view we live in, right? We're, we're products, we're we're numbers, we're things behind bars, we're not people. So when you look at it as a cost cost benefit analysis, you're like, well, it's going to cost us too much. We'll just keep the people in jail. And so that's just a really, really poor way to sort of look at this um, because we are talking about human life here. Yeah, I'd like to build on that with really why we do what we do as decriminalized nature. And I, I think this speaks for probably most of the leadership in decriminalized nature, of which we have amazing leaders all over the country. Um, it really is about shifting minds, shifting the collective consciousness, right? So we've, we, we are in this moment in time and as uh, the collective consciousness right now, we're so deeply embedded in fear and we're fighting with each other. And, you know, while the billionaires are getting richer, we're sort of fighting over scraps. And then there's this big game that happens with creation of fear on social media. And, and then we all just fight more. And then you get a billionaire who buys Twitter and now we're going to get even more fear on Twitter and we're all just going to keep fighting with each other. And, and it just works for them, right? It works for them, but not us because the game is keep us fighting with each other and, uh, and, then, and then the rules don't change. But if you look at the entirety of, of the system, if we just had a marginal shift in the, the voting practices, the voting uh, trends, 
uh, dynamics with the underlying population that shifted more towards compassion away from fear, then things like expungement would be absolutely mandatory because people would see the people in prison as themselves. People would not tolerate homelessness because you'd be like, that's me, right? But this whole separation, the fear causes us to detach from each other, detach from the natural world. It becomes all about how am I going to survive and get mine, right? And, and we see that through, it, through cannabis with everybody who was on the medical train and compassion, all of a sudden the profit thing comes and everybody shifts not everybody a bunch of people like yourselves are awesome but there's a lot of people out there who just like threw it in and are like okay i gotta get mine and they just sell out to the system but if if we can get these plant medicines out there and hold them in a good way where people can be pip you know the entire collective consciousness can be shifted towards even a five to ten percent shift towards greater compassion in the in, in, in people then we would be passing policies that would get put pe less people in prison that would have better distribution of wealth that would have better support of people who are uh, you know marginalized or in need of support the elderly you know children um people who are down on their luck because of mental health breakdowns and and we'd have a lot less people homeless all that people a lot less people in prison we get this at decrim nature like we understand this fundamentally and people think that we're a movement we people just want to get high sometimes no like we get that these things affect consciousness. It expands your connection to, to life, to creation. And, and that at the end of the day changes behavior at the poll, at the ballot box, it changes behavior at the uh, cash register. And, uh, and that's how we shift uh, the planet towards a more compassionate state. And I'd just like to add to that hashtag, no more divide and conquer. And uh, don't allow this uh, scenario uh, to continue and make you the economic slave that you are. Uh, m moving on from that, um, why do you think that uh, Kratom or Kratom, uh, being kind of entheogenic in nature, uh, managed to fly under the radar of the uh, federal government or governments, small and large, and not get as much pushback? So I'm not really sure why it hasn't gotten much pushback, but I know within the last year, it seems like it did. I know a lot of friends that were in the uh, the world of Kratom and, and were really fighting against them, trying to reschedule it or schedule it, um, make it illegal and a bunch of other, I don't know if it was just on the state level or the federal level, but I remember there was a pretty big community that came out there and was like, no, this isn't going to stand. And they ended up not uh, criminalizing it. So that's great. Um, but um, but I don't, I don't, I'm not really sure why Kratom, maybe because it's, uh, you know, it doesn't have... You know, it's more of a, you know, as far as I understand, you know, to be more sort of uh, more like the ambient, as you were speaking earlier, more relaxing, more like sort of calming, it maybe isn't so paradigm shifting, um, whereas some of these other plants are. And of course, the power structure, you know, of course, they prefer you to be calm and docile. Then, you know, that's the whole Soma argument from from Huxley's Island, right? Uh, if, well, you know, if we don't want to change the world to just get everyone Soma, make them feel good about things for a little bit, and they'll forget that there's, you know, it's sort of like a um, a contemporary version of breads and circuses, right? We feed people, we keep them entertained. No one will change anything, right? So, same word idea. So, not saying that Kratom is that at all, but but uh, but by um, but by the understanding of what where sort of the paradigm shifts are, um, you know, also the same question: why is why is Amanita you know legal? Why is the Tura legal? Why are all these other plants still legal, right? So, I'm not sure why Kratom managed to slip under the radar. Perhaps you have better understanding of it than I do, but uh, um, but that isn't something that we've included in the uh, the resolution per se. I guess technically it does fit under the indoamines uh, category. We have tryptamines, phenethylamines, and indoamines there. Um, so in a place where um, where that was uh, an issue, hopefully that this would be able to, to shift that, but we don't actually address that directly. Excellent. I was just really curious. I knew there was a little pushback in the beginning, but uh, typically when the system of control is out to make something illegal or to punish people for it, a little pushback doesn't stop them. Um, that being said, um, can you talk about some of the current uh, ballot initiatives that are out there right now uh, to attempt uh, to decriminalize nature? Larry, you want to take that one first? I could uh, piggyback. Sure, sure. Yeah, so um, so ballot initiative-wise, um, there was something that was happening in Michigan and Colorado. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't get enough signatures. Uh, the only ballot initiative, well, and the city level, the ballot initiatives that have passed have been Washington, D.C. with a 76% voter approval and Detroit with a 61% voter approval. 
Uh, on the statewide level, there's really only two places that that's uh, happening right now. Uh, Oregon, uh, which uh, passed M109 and M110, which you see has kind of been a bit of a shit show in terms of the rollout. And then also Colorado, uh, they're uh, the same group that passed in Oregon is trying to pass in Colorado. Uh, there is a, a lot of uh, pushback from the grassroots community there. They don't like the fact that big money deep pockets are coming in there and trying to dictate their policy. And, uh, you know, they're saying it's the same thing. It's going to be five to seven thousand dollars for, you know, um, sitting in ceremony. I, I know people that went to Oregon to try and look into their trainings and it's like 10,000 plus just to get trained. You need licenses all across the way. So it's just out of reach of most people. And where does that cost go? It goes to the individual. Uh, while at the same time in Oregon, you can't harvest a mushroom. That's still a felony. You can't grow a mushroom. That's still a felony. You can't share in ceremony. That's still a felony. But $5,000 to $7,000, you know, luxury retreat center, uh, you can go ahead and do that. And so it's going to be interesting to see how that shakes out because you right now on your next election, you have a lot of people that are thinking about opting out. And so now the whole state is going to be kind of divided. And a lot of the opt out isn't just because they're against psilocybin, it's because they're against corporatization or these luxury retreats. And so you're seeing a lot of deep pockets sort of having to reconsider what's going on there. And then they're moving that into Colorado. And, um, you know, that that'll happen. That will happen in a few days. Um, so we'll get to see what happens on that as well. But uh, but there's a really strong community out there that's saying, you know, hey, this isn't this isn't OK. Uh, you need to spend a little bit more time talking with the community out here. Carlos, maybe you can speak to that a little more. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm more, you know, I'm fascinated by where we're at in this entire kind of state of uh, the psychedelic legalization slash decriminalization struggle that's happening because the collective consciousness has learned so much from cannabis, like we're in a more intelligent species now, particularly in the U.S., because of all of the stuff that we did wrong in cannabis collectively, right? And so, so now a lot of the leadership all over the U.S. has a higher bar a higher standard for what corporate corporations and corporate leaders and lobbyists have to put out there to meet their expectations. And in California, um, you know, the the it was New Approach Pack who who advanced the initiative here. Initially, they were working with Decrim Nature, and then they set limits, and then uh, we opposed it at that point because then that becomes modified uh, criminalization. And it was interesting the way they were pushing the narrative was very synthetic based. It was very um, uh, you know, pandering to one particular group as opposed to healing all people. And uh, they didn't really pick up on the nature component of it, which is for us has been very successful in changing minds when people realize we talk, we're talking about nature, things that our ancestors have done forever. And they quickly shift to like, okay, that shouldn't be criminalized. That doesn't make sense. But they, they went to the uh, route before because of their corporate donors of really pushing synthetics. And enough assembly members didn't buy it that it was easy to, to defeat. Um, and so, and then in Colorado, as Larry mentioned, the people there are really hip to the corporate tactics now. And so they're, they're, they're basically calling them on it. And I think uh, come you know, election day that it will lose in Colorado, uh, the, the, the corporate backed um, policy. What that's going to do, I think, over the next few years is cause the investors who are behind the lobbyists to say, wait a second, what the hell is happening here? Maybe we're not ready and start threatening to shift their investments, which gives us as the decriminalization movement, the people's movement to really um, establish a stronger footing and a stronger place of, of leverage uh, so that if they do want to come forward, they're going to have to reckon with us collectively as a society who is pushing for decriminalization without limits. Um, and then if we're able to do that and get to a place where we can push a, a piece of legislation together that meets our needs, then, then maybe we do that with them. But otherwise, you know, it's hard to imagine that corporate greed is going to be like, yeah, we want to work with you and make sure that everything's decriminalized and abundance win. It's hard to imagine right, that. Right. Completely different model, right? Their model is scarcity and profiteering and treat people like product. So my, my sense is that we're just going to keep winning city after city after city after city. And over a few years, people will be like, okay, we get it now. Decriminalization is the place we have to start. Enough people will get that, that, that hopefully we can beat, beat down the corporate greed machine. And uh, no, JR, ahead, we're, we, we'll, we should um, wrap up the stream soon-ish. So I'm um, just going to shout out to everyone that's watching on the live stream. If you have any questions or anything like that, throw them in the chat and I'll take a look. Um, but otherwise, we'll we'll let Jr. get to our, our last uh, few, few questions or so, since we want to make sure that we get the guests out when they need to head out. Yes, and again, thank you for your time. Um, 
Now, as you kind of talked about uh, certain legislation and ballot initiatives and, and what's behind them, um, can you kind of talk about uh, the Southern West United States and how their, uh, their mescaline traditions and their mescaline community is trying to be infiltrated by, you know, larger entities? Can you kind of talk about that a little bit and explain to the people uh, what they might want to look out for if they are in their area trying to organize and keep situations like this from happening? You're talking about Southwest with peyote? Yes. Cacti yeah. in general. Uh, in general? Cacti, peyote, you know, anything. Yeah, I'll speak on the, the cactus issue in Southwest. And it's important to couch that within the, con the context of the entire um, peyote habitat which is uh, from Southern Texas uh, all the way down to Northern Jalisco, uh, the, run, the desert that runs that whole way. And, and the, the history of peyote use and sort of discovery of it as, a, as this spiritual medicine goes back five to 10,000 years. It may go longer, but our earliest records show its use around 5,000 years ago uh, in what are known as like the Udo Aztecan community population. Um, these are the people who speak not what were, you know, the, the, the and, and branches of um, that language, which gave rise to the Aztecs, but even way before the Aztecs, the Wijarica were using peyote. They're probably the oldest tradition on record of using peyote for spiritual reasons. And, um, and they, they um, really taught, for the most part, a lot of people, including people in the Southwest, about peyote. And so the Lipan Apache which are in the Southwest, but slightly out of the desert region that where this peyote grows, learned about peyote about a thousand years ago from their neighbors to the South uh, in what we call today Mexico. And then from there, the Lipan Apache taught some of the other tribes like the, um, the, the Comanche and the Kiowa. The Kiowa then about maybe uh, 150 to 200 years ago taught the Diné and the, um, and, and the, the Lakota. And, and that's just what we did with medicines. We shared medicines. Never before in the history of the world has any particular tribe or indigenous community sought to control a plant, a food, uh, something that comes from the earth and say, this is ours. Because usually what, what we've always done, not usually, what we've always done is traded with each other. And this is how humanity became so successful with each other with, with, uh, in general, because we traded. Uh, and, um, and, but for the first time, we're seeing this, you know, interesting, unfortunate, but very fascinating dynamic where corporate interests are now collaborating with a small group within the Native American church called the National Council Native American Church. And um, with the intention of keeping peyote criminalized for everybody who isn't part of a federally recognized tribe. And that includes about 7.6 million people of Mexican ancestry from peyote lands. There's 40 million people from Mexican ancestry in the U.S., 7.6 million um, who are from peyote uh, lands in terms of ancestry who have ancestral rights to these, these peyote plants. But the idea is that if you can create a control system where naturally grown peyote is only controlled by a few groups, um, then it obviously impacts pricing and distribution systems, much like vertically integrated cannabis, where you have a cultivation system and you have a distribution system owned by the same entity. Glasshouse is a good example. Um, and, uh, and then they get the, the, the benefits of, of that system being vertically integrated. But then no one else can have access to peyote. So where do they turn? They turn to synthetic compounds. And what we're seeing is groups like Journey Colab emerge who have relationships with some of these same corporate players who are um, uh, who are manufacturing, who got money from Y Combinator as a, an example, which is an accelerated fund where you have to hurry up and make profits quickly, return them, they get out, and then other investors come in and take it from there. Um, so Journey Colab is a uh, for-profit pharmaceutical company that will give a certain percentage of their profits to certain indigenous groups that they choose. Uh, but the rest of the either non-federally recognized tribes in the US, of which there are many, or uh, people that are not affiliated with Native American churches uh, from with federally recognized tribes, and certainly all other people, including Mexicans uh, from peyote lands, would be remain criminalized. And our entire ethos is that we can't own nature. Nature is greater than us, right? So nature owns nature, and we're part of it. Uh, so no one can own uh, peyote. Uh, but what we should all be doing 
is growing it uh, uh, here locally in the U.S. so that we reduce the amount of demand on the uh, on the native habitat. And so we're all, we're advocating decriminalization of peyote cultivation, so everybody can everybody who wants to can grow peyote. If you can grow a plant for 15 years and get it to a point where you're ready to take it to a journey, you have built a relationship of reverence with that plant by nurturing it for such a long time. And so. Uh, really, the, um, the the respect for nature comes through cultivation and, and and nurturing that relationship. As anybody who cultivates cannabis knows, it becomes more than just some some you know thing. It's 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 a relationship you build. I think how we're seeing that play out now across the U.S. is, uh, for example, in some place like Santa Cruz, and Santa Cruz is just the uh, the above. Uh, tip of the iceberg and but below the tip of the iceberg is this same group uh, specifically I, I, ICPI IPCI uh, which is uh, owns 605 acres uh, in southern Texas uh, run by um, somebody that's on the multidisciplinary association of psychedelic studies public benefit corporation which is the for-profit arm of, of maps um, and uh, by the name of Miriam Blatt and she was going around and calling uh, her and some other folks were calling other teams and trying to really bully them into keeping not just peyote but all cacti containing mescaline criminalized. Now, if it's really about a sustainability issue and not about profiteering for a company that wants to synthesize mescaline, why are you also trying to criminalize all cacti containing mescaline? Most of these cacti are totally legal anyway. You can buy them at the Home Depot. You can buy them at the nursery. You can buy them everywhere, right? They grow all over the place. So now they're actually going in and trying to criminalize this in places that has never been criminalized before. Uh, unfortunately, they were successful in Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz changed their uh, resolution to keep all peyote, not to me, all cacti containing mescaline, including peyote, criminalized. And they tried to do this in other places as well. So this is a really big problem because at the end of the day, you know, there's what uh, close to 100 different cacti that contain mescaline. And so why are you trying to do this? And so um, really, this is a big conversation. And, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, someone like a Michael Pollan, who wrote the docuseries, they did this entire bit. The fourth uh, episode was all about mescaline. Uh, I have to really question Michael Pollan's journalistic integrity. You have an entire episode on mescaline. You talk about one point of view, then you give a 10 minute clip about decriminalized nature. And rather than, for example, offering some of the insight from um, uh, Ikutsi Valadez, who's one of our board members who comes from the Wiradika tradition and has a very strong understanding of peyote, a lot of history with peyote and has her own uh, thoughts around peyote cultivation, they didn't even put her on the piece. You know, all they did was they said, oh, decriminalized nature is bad because they, they put peyote on there. So he wasn't even offering both sides of the perspective. And lo and behold, uh, Michael Pollan is now also part of the Indigenous Medicine Conservation Fund, which is one of the organizations that will be getting donations from Journey Collab, which will then be uh, you know, putting that out to the rest of the communities that they choose. So it's a really complicated uh, web. Uh, once you get into it, you know, you start seeing, you start following the money trail, so to speak. You realize that there's a lot of players behind there that are, uh, you know, funding uh, each other or funding things or, or, or trying to pass policy that would benefit uh, their buddies in the synth uh, synthetic organizations or the synthetic businesses. Um, and so that's really, really uh, something that's it's it's sad to see, you know, because at the end of the day, I'd much rather have been planting peyote seeds for the last three years than arguing about who has access or who has ownership over peyote. So different yeah. than having a plant, right? And, and I just want to clarify one point. You know, I'm, I'm a member of two Native American churches. Um, my ancestry is indigenous. My grandmother here, she's indigenous from Jalisco. Um, most, you know, there's 400 Native American churches. Uh, most are decentralized. Most are not part of any kind of centralized system. Most support decriminalization of peyote cultivation, at least. Um, and so we're talking about a very small number of people. Um, I, I don't, I want to make sure that we're not throwing any shade on the Native American church as a group. They've really fought hard to ensure they protect the religious rights. And we want to help protect their religious rights. We are working in collaboration with a number of Native American churches to actually cultivate peyote through nonprofits uh, and through their churches to in, create a sustainable system here in the US and um, so that we're not poaching from, from the gardens. Uh, but what's happening, what, the reason you're hearing me and Larry be so forthright about all of this is because we didn't, what we didn't do well enough in cannabis process was call out the players who were seeking to control. And we're gonna do that now. So, and you know, uh, and we've been doing that, we've taken our lumps uh, we'll continue to take our lumps, but we invite everybody out there, you know, speak the truth because the, the truth will set us free. Uh, it's the only thing that will, um, and then they hate it when we do this, right? <laughs> so we do it more. No, I really appreciate it. And I think uh, folks such as yourself, Carlos and Larry, uh, are really important to the conversation and the narrative. Um, I think that um, folks like you that are willing to take a lot of time, a lot of research and a lot of study 
to understand what's going on behind the scenes that a lot of us are completely blind or unaware to. Um, and, and for you to be able to show their hand and let us see them for what they are and what their intentions are, are a very powerful thing. And again, we really, really appreciate you coming on here and addressing some of these issues. Um, as we kind of wrap things up, um, can you please, please tell people how they can, uh, how they can find resources and good information on entogenic plants and fungi and uh, how they can uh, kind of educate themselves. What are some great resources to help them start maybe uh, accessing nature rather than accessing pharmaceutical uh, uh, solutions? Larry, can I give the general, then I'll hand it to you for the uh, a great kind of closeout you do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but the, the biggest, most important thing that I think uh, is the next sort of phase in decriminalized nature is for people who are ready to go on that journey to find people to help them through the process or at least educate or inform them. These are space holders. To this, we do want to lift up a lot of the indigenous traditional um, you know, space holding communities. Um, and not to say, because we, we don't believe in sort of regulating people and telling people what to do because that infringes on people's personal sovereignty. What we will say is that there are a lot of people out there who are doing a lot of work to really understand a good way to hold these medicines and, and, and go through the experience and then integrate from a place of deep humility, reverence, in a way that connects you to the healing process. That, you know, we're in a dangerous moment because we're in the United States where the ego is so powerful, right? That the fear is so powerful. And so for many people who go into these medicines, if they're not getting the a good support system coming out or they're not finding it in community or you know there's great things that are in, in internet-based support systems that you can now access so that you have conversations with people after your journey and and talk through with people and, and really find grounding that grounding is so critical and so if you can find your way to some indigenous healers indigenous space holders that's great um you know a lot of people like to do it for themselves which is also made you know sit in their own space which is great um, but make sure you have some phone numbers of some people you can integrate with afterwards in case you have a tough journey. Uh, just always be aware of the ego's desire to, um, to come in and, and spin the narrative in, in a way that might make you feel a little grandiose about your experience you just had. If you had that connection with God, you want to stay humble about it. Uh, you know, you, we're all God, right? So <laughs> can we just have some kind of a mic drop end right there? But okay. So I'll go now. I can't follow that up, but um, but in terms of resources, you know, I think that's um, that's the challenge of right now. Like most of the resources that you see out there right now are all like even them trying to say, oh, psilocybin's magic mushrooms. It's all still it's the science. If it's happening through science, then it's got to be synthetic because that's just there's, there's no consistency, quote unquote, in, in natural plant material, fungal materials. So um, so a lot of the research you're seeing out there is mostly related to these other types of things. Now, there's a lot of books out there, a lot of great people that have done this work, uh, but also those folks are often in the Western mindset. So you're not often seeing people that have been doing this work for lineages for decades in the Amazon, for example, writing a book that's going to make it to anyone's, you know, table here in the U.S., you know, so, um, but it doesn't mean you can't have conversations and there's a difference between oral tradition and written tradition. And there's so much to be gained from the opportunity to have a conversation with somebody in oral tradition. And a lot of times these experiences, you can't really explain. They're ineffable. They're, they're beyond words, right? So the best thing to do is to talk to a mentor, talk to a friend, talk to a guide, someone that can be in your community, can share, you know, okay, this is kind of what I thought about that, but we don't really have the answer. We don't really know. So, so for the basics, you know, in terms of, you know, um, you know, there's always the standard of Arrowhead trying to go places like that to find like, you know, the very basics of the chemistry or all that kind of thing. You know, um, you know, there's other places out there you can find, you know, hear about sort of integration circles, things like that. You know, the nonprofit that uh, I work with as well um, does integration. There's a lot of groups that are doing integration all across the U.S. Um, so, uh, so that's a good way to kind of tap into the community locally. There's a lot of psychedelic societies locally. But really, at this point in time, I almost recommend, you know, being involved with peer groups groups of people that know what you're talking about, you know, and not having to be going to authorities that maybe have a different agenda or have a different sort of worldview or different understanding of what's going on. Um, and then just, you know, speaking to friends and family that might know about it or community members that might know about it. So uh, that's what I would say. And that's what we're really trying to do in all the places that uh, do have decriminalized, uh, really work in sort of unison to try and help them create like a parallel educational system there or an integration support system or other things like that. So they can have people there to kind of uh, speak to uh, on this topic. Um, so that's what I would say about that. Awesome. Excellent. Um, I'm, uh, I'm here in Oregon and the rains have come 
the fungi, I can smell them in the air. Um, I really would like to be able to go out and harvest my nature uh, without having a felony. Uh, so after this show, if you could help me in any way, make that happen. Obviously, I would super, super appreciate it. Uh, thank you again so much for your time. And Sam, go ahead and close us out. Yeah, Carlos and Larry, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Make sure to check out the organization at decriminalizednature.org. Um, someone on the chat earlier, Gina, asked if you guys sell T-shirts that say De decriminalize nature. You are in luck. They sell T-shirts and hats and bags and all sorts of stuff. So definitely check out decriminalizednature.org slash shop and you can get some rad gear there as well. Um, thanks once again. Like and subscribe. Tell your friends. We appreciate your time. Have a great night and a great week, and we'll speak to you again soon. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.